Um, we're going to be talking about liquid bulk cargo surveying, um, the surveyor's role, some things to look out for, some experiences and things that we went through. But first, I'm going to start off, I'm going to read a poem that I found a number of years ago, written by a, an unknown surveyor. We could never attach a name to it. And it kind of puts a lot about cargo surveying into an interesting perspective. Um, the poem is titled, The Other Man's Loss is My Gain. Uh, but hang on, let me just bring up my PowerPoint also. Um, okay, hang on. And I believe we're there. Excellent. Stick with, stick with me one second, I apologize. Okay, is, is my, my slide there? Hello. Hello, Jerry. No, it isn't yet. Ah, hang on, let me try again. Plan B. Hang on. <clears throat> That's looking better. Yeah, now we got you. Here. Go right to the left, right to the left, to the top of the screen, to the left, from beginning. There you go. Okay. We're with got you. The, We're with you. Got the slides. Excellent. So the, the title of the poem is The Other Man's Loss is My Gain. I'm a cargo surveyor, a checker and weigher. I separate, sort, and compare. The stained and the sound with my ear to the ground for misrepresentations take care. I boss the longshoremen, a dozen or more men, drop hooks when they see me pass by. For handling in transit, how anything stands it, is surely a wonder, say I. There's rumor of shipwrecks. There's oil in the tween decks. There's salt water, fresh water, brine. There's contamination, too much fermentation, and leakage in 10 casks of wine. There's copra that's rotten, six bales of wet cotton, crude rubber, raw sugar, and grain. A ship that's on fire, just what I require. The other man's loss is my gain. An overturned truck is a great piece of luck. A worm-eaten barge is my meat. A smothering line with a leak is divine. As are ship sweat and dampness and heat. Spontaneous ignitions, all damaged conditions. Some matting infested with lice and flour with weevils and all sorts of evils, and coffee with inherent vice. Some fruit overripe and some old rusted pipe, men's shirts, chocolate, candy and soap, some toys and transshipment, electric equipment and coils of the finest hemp rope, some pilferage in cases of Chantilly laces, a carton of damaged canned milk, a statue for church, and a long futile search for the cause of some damage to silt. Some lumber that's green, the worst that I've seen, split peas and some long Chinese hair, a shipper pernickety, antiques very rickety, shoes that just cannot pair. I rate consignees and some maggots and cheese, some shrimp from Japan packed in rice, some damage by hurricane, Cecil that's wet by rain, Pockets of damp, swollen rice. There's beet seed that's mildewed, some olives quite ill-hued, a harp with some moth-eaten books, a rug from Damascus, a fake, if you ask us, that's damaged by stevedore's hooks. A cargo surveyor, a life that is gayer, you really must search far to find, with trips out of town that I never tur turn down, though hundred odd jobs trail behind. For the adjuster, my forces I muster. To minimize loss, I sweat blood. I squeeze the last dollar, though retailers holler. The market with off-grade I flood. 
I salvage wet carbon black, poke at a bag that is slack, climb over mountains of scrap. I help stow some big sedans, look at some leaking cans, finding what caused the mishap. There's heat that's intense, there's smoke that is dense, and holds at a dark sum and deep. And jobs late at night when it's really a fight to ward off some much needed sleep. Now I'm not complaining, I'm merely explaining the ins and outs of my trade. For take it or leave it, I like it, believe it. It's one way of making the grave. And I, as I said, I found this by accident looking for something else's. Probably the only thing of its kind I ever found referring to our profession. But it really kind of makes the point on many things when you look at cargo surveying, cargo claims, and so on. But we're back to where we started now. So we're going to discuss today liquid bulk cargo surveying, the surveyor's role, things to look for, things you want to acquire when you get on board as far as documents and information. And one of the first things I tell guys that start working with us is to always remember when you're boarding a ship, you're not just going on a vessel that's carrying cargo, you're entering the home of that crew. It's where they live, it's their home while they're at sea. And I tell the fellows, you have to respect that home as such in all your dealings with the, with the officers and the crew. So we're gonna discuss it, this is a little information my company, where we are, and so on. Uh, this is all based on liquid bulk arriving in the port of New York. Um, we specialize in dealing with castor oil and, and olive oil. This uh, slide you're looking at here is the top of a storage tank at a chemical company. Um, top of that tank is just about eight and a half stories off the ground. A little bit about myself. I'm a, an AMS with SAMS. Um, I own and operate the company. I oversee everything, whether I'm handling it or someone else does. Um, I was an investigator for more than 20 years. I did a lot of work investigating accidents, casualties of all kind, uh, frauds, both insurance fraud, commercial frauds, uh, risk analysis. We, and I still do litigation support and trial preparation as a surveyor. You're looking here at a manifold setup um, at one of the tank terminals where we do work. And the way they run it there, I kind of like it. Most places, number lines, everything with them, the lines are colors. When you're getting ready or preparing um, for a ship coming in where you're gonna have your cargo discharged, you're gonna walk that line and make sure every valve is in the proper position that it's going to the correct tank and so on. Over here, you're looking out over the cargo deck of a parcel tanker. In this instance, we're actually anchored up in New York Harbor. Um, off the port side, we've got a barge there. We'd be lightering about 2,000 metric tons of product to that barge, which will later be discharged uh, to a chemical plant. Um, contamination is always an issue. Most of the products we deal with are either food grade or medical grade. And you want to, you're going to be taking samples, which we'll discuss a little later on. You'll also be looking at loading port samples, samples that were taken when the ship was loaded originally. Um, the, one of the products we deal with, or a couple of them, are very hygroscopic, very sensitive to moisture. Moisture content can completely change the product. Uh, from a visual perspective, we're always worried about seeing particulate matter in the, in the product or haze or you know, anything other than what we know that product should look like. And here's a great example. Um, this ship arrived in the port of New York. We opened the, the hatch to look down and take samples. And the first thing we see is this coating failure in the hatch combing, streaks of rust leading down into the tank. Uh, it's obvious that as this occurs, whatever material flaking off here is going into the tank and, of course, into the product. And as you look at it, it's obvious this condition existed for a long time. It didn't occur during the voyage. But the loading port surveyor, he found no objection to this, knowing that this was going to be a medical grade product. 
in this instance, when we found this, we uh, issued or served the ship a letter of protest, which is a document basically preserving our client's right, the owner of the product, pointing out the condition and that it existed for an extended period of time. This turned into a claim in the end because there was some damage to the product. That tank contained just over a thousand metric tons um, of the oil that we brought out. And this is, uh, you know, another view, you know, showing the extent of this corrosion, the extent of the coating failure. Um, so basically, as a cargo surveyor, your, your role is to be, as it says here, an independent, uninterested party. You want to verify that loading operations were carried out in accordance with the contract specifications and any applicable standards as to the type of product or the locality where this was done. You're also going to make sure that unloading operations are carried out properly. Some products have to be heated during the voyage and we'll get into the documents a bit later. You're looking for the heating log from the ship, which shows the temperatures on an hourly basis for the entire duration of the voyage. So you're gonna review the ship's documents. As I mentioned, issue a letter of protest if you have an irregularity that warrants it. Um, loading port samples are done by the loading port surveyor in the presence of ship crew. Uh, they're sealed, they're carried on board the ship to be turned over to the discharge port surveyor and held onto. So with samples, with liquid products of this type, every time the product is moved or transferred, samples are taken. When the manufacturer produces their product, they take samples which are shipped to our clients. They're analyzed, they go to a laboratory. Uh, our clients either approve or disapprove the product based on the analysis. And then the product is then moved from the factory to storage tanks. Again, samples are taken and all samples are retained. So that should there be a claim on the product, damage to the product, in theory and often in practice, by comparing all samples, it can be determined during what part of the transportation of the product after manufacturing the damage occurred. Um, samples are considered sacred. The chain of custody has to be very precise and accurate uh, where they're taken, when they're taken, by whom, and so on. When the ship arrives, we take samples from every, every tank that contains our cargo, and we take samples at different levels in the tank, as well as what's called a running sample, which is a representative sample of, of a column of the product in the tank. Uh, before any cargo hoses are hooked up or anything, we're checking the manifold, we're checking any cargo hoses to make sure they're clean, that they're suitable. Same thing for the receiving tanks on shore um, and the manifold, all the lines on shore all have to be checked to make sure that they're suitable for what we're doing. And in this slide, we're lighter into that barge that's on the right side of the screen. In this instance, the cargo hose belongs to the barge. It's then given over to the ship. It's connected to the manifold on the left to the left of the two fellows on deck. And again, that's after inspecting that line and the manifold and in the fittings. Um, they're checking it themselves to make sure there's no liquid in it. They'll put it on, we inspect to make sure that they use the amount of bolts that the flange provides for and that the gasket that's being used, it was never used before. And I say, beware of pigs, but we're not talking about the ones that make bacon. We're talking about a piping pig. Often when these ships are loaded, the product may travel a quarter of a mile, a half a mile or more from a storage tank to the ship. And depending on where you are, when they load the ship, they'll put what's called a piping pig in the line. And it could be foam, it could be a ball of cloth. There are several different kinds depending on the product. And then once that's in, they put a head of high pressure air on it and the pig is pushed down that line from the tank all the way to the ship so that it sends all the remaining cargo, the residual cargo from the lines to the ship. Then the lines are blown with air. They take other samples. 
eventually the ship starts its transit to our destination. Um, here you have a little information again about tanks. If the shore tanks are empty before we, we fill them with, with the discharge, we visually inspect the inside of them. Then we authorize the terminal to close the tank, put the plate on. We check the lines and so on. Now, if the product is going to be commingled with existing product in the tank, of course, we want to verify that it is the same product and the same grade. And samples are taken to determine the quantity in the tank. Now, these products are sold by weight, not by volume is how they're traded. In this case, we're speaking of oils. And obviously, if you eat an oil, it'll expand and technically you have more volume in the tank, but the weight remains constant. Conversely, if the oil were to cool, it'll contract or shrink and the volume in the tank decreases. So what's done when we sample to determine the quantity in a tank, we also take the temperature of the product. And the temperature is generally taken slightly above the bottom of the tank, near the middle of the tank, and a couple of feet below the surface of the liquid. The three temperatures are averaged. That provides the average temperature of the tank. From that, using the sample, the specific gravity of the product is determined at that moment in time when the samples are taken. And then you can determine unit weight. In my country, it's pounds per gallon. In other parts of the world, obviously, it's liter weight. Then we walk the lines from the tank back to the ship, make sure every line is where it should be, nothing's being diverted or pilfered, and that all the connections you know, appear appropriate. And what we do, which a lot of larger companies don't do, which is very important, we maintain continuous attendance from the moment that ship is all fast until our cargo lines have been disconnected someone is in attendance. And the main reason for that is it preserves the client's rights in the event that there's a claim or a dispute. Many claims have been lost because the surveyor was not in attendance for the entire operation. Some of these operations can run 48 to 72 hours before you're done. When, and some of our products are uh, kind of viscous, so it's required that the tanks have to be squeegeed when they're empty. And crew members go down with long broom handles and squeegees and push all remaining product down into the sump of the, uh, the deep well pump that pumps the ship to shore. After that, the lines are then blown to shore to take any residual product back to the storage tanks. Um, this is one tank terminal where we do some of our work. And there's tanks of different sizes. Most of them have steam lines attached if the product needs to be maintained at a temperature also to raise the temperature to be able to, for them to uh, dispense the product from the tanks more easily. And here, this is the location after we lighter the barge, um, the barge goes into a chemical plant and then discharges and fills the tanks at the chemical plant. The fellow in this picture is putting the line together. Same thing, a gasket will go in between the two. There's always a spill containment box under any joints in the cargo hoses. So once the discharge is done, we have to determine the volume of the product received on shore. Samples are again taken. They're sent to a laboratory for analysis and for the specific gravity for the time of final gauging. Um, on products that are viscous, like some of the ones we do, final gauging is generally done 48 hours after the final discharge, that way all the air that's in from when they blow the lines settles out or rises out through the product. And as a note, immediately after discharge, when the lines are blown, if you were to gauge the tanks and then you come back two days later, the temperature is really close to what it was. I could see on a tank with 2000 metric tons of product, a difference of a half inch in the volume just from the air that was trapped in the oil before it all rises out. So after final gauging, we determine the landed weight, how much oil was received. All the samples are retained by us along with the loading port samples in the event that there's a dispute or a claim. Um, once we in the terminal agree as to the volume of product 
parked in the tank that we call it the closing when the job is done. Then we issue a certificate of landed weight, you know, to our client or any parties they ask us to provide it with. Uh, this is from a lightering operation up in New York Harbor. The ship is using its crane, bringing over the cargo hose from the barge. Uh, that barge, incidentally, was one of the first double hulled barges in the United States. And right now, that would be about 62 years old, that barge. It's finally been retired. Uh, when you're arriving, very often we're meeting the ship in the anchorage. We're coming out on a launch. We're going to observe the draft on the ship, go around it, uh, take the draft notes, compare it with the ship's instruments on board. When you're on board the ship, documents are sacred. You have to verify all the bills of ladings, get copies, get a copy of the ship's stowage plan, the loading portologies, which would be the, the quantity of our product on board. We always want to know what the last three cargoes were in every tank that we have product in. And we want to know the method and how the tanks were washed prior to putting our product in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the cargo heating record, when the ship arrives, we're taking ullages, determining what's on board in the tanks. And this is where you have to be careful with some of the shipping companies. Um, we prefer and, or demand, I should say, that we do all ullages on deck manually through the sounding ports at the top of the tanks. Uh, very often the ship will say, well, we did it electronically at the loading port. We have to do it electronically here. And I say, well, you can certainly, you know, give me your electronic readings, but we're taking everything manually on deck. And there's a similar situation with ships on sampling. Uh, we do all sampling through one of those hatches, like I showed you earlier, where we drop samplers down and take our samples. Uh, very often ships want to circulate the product before sampling. Uh, we refuse to let them do that. If there was water at the bottom of the tank, it's now being distributed up through the tank as they circulate it. And they often try to force us to take samples from the ship's pump stacks. And we prefer not to, again, we manually sample everything. We take bottom samples from the tank and what we call running samples. Um, we always ask for a copy of the vessel particulars. Um, also, the ship's P&A manual, some of our products require under MARPOL that a pre-wash be conducted at the discharge facility. And we always take copies of the pages in the P&A manual that refer to our tanks, the pre-washing method, what the temperature of the pre-wash water should be, and so on. Um, many ships don't want to heat the water to the prescribed temperature because it basically costs the money to run their boiler. Uh, our product, it wants to be 60 degrees Celsius for the pre-washed water. And we actually send one of our guys down into the engineering room to see the actual gauges uh, coming off that water from the boiler. One of the other documents that I consider very important to secure from a ship that many other people never ask for is I want a copy of the crew list. And my reason for this is, should there be a claim? Should there be product damage? Well, now we have a list of witnesses, a list of people that can be interviewed to verify what occurred during the voyage. Uh, I'd like to, in, in recent years, first with Ebola and now with COVID, uh, I wanna know where the ship has been before it comes to my port. And I wanna know anyone that signed on with that ship and where they joined before they arrived in my port. Um, these are pictures of some of the tools that we use. On the left of your screen is a thermoprobe. This is how we take the temperature of the oil. Uh, in the center of the screen is a product called Color Cut. We use that either on the, the plumb bob on the uh, gauging tape or on our bottom sampler to test if there's any water at the bottom of the tank. And on the right, of course, is the gauging tape. Uh, cargo hatch inspections, we want to see, check the seals, look for any signs that water came in, any salt residue. Uh, we see salt residue, we become a little concerned. If we don't like the way the gaskets look, we're concerned. So the two devices you see in the picture 
On the left, it's called a Bacon Bomb. And that's a bottom sampler. Uh, at the bottom left corner of the picture, that's a plunger. When it, when it hits the bottom of the tank, it opens, and then it lets the product come up and fill it. The, on the right is a cage sampler, and that you can use to take a sample at any level in the tank you want by dropping it in and then giving a little jerk on the line. It'll pull the cork out and the bottle will fill. And you can also use that for what we call a running sample, which is you let it down, pop the cork, and then you pull it up rather rapidly and it takes a representative sample over that column in the tank from whatever level you started to the top. Um, little side note on the bacon bomb. Occasionally we work out of town, we have to fly places, bring equipment with us, sometimes bring samples and so on. And I do all this using a large Pelican case that has signage all over it saying Marine Surveyors Tools and Equipments, uh, my cell phone number, my business card taped on top. And if we pack samples, we put the MSDS, the material data safety sheet, right inside the case with a little note written to the TSA or whoever the governing agency is that may search that, explaining what's in there and suggesting they call us if they have any questions. And needless to say, on a trip out to Houston a couple of years ago, I'm sitting on the plane waiting to take off, my phone rings. And I have a very confused fellow on the other side who's obviously got the bacon bomb in his hand and he's reading the name stamped right into the plate on top that says bacon bomb. Uh, after a couple of minutes of explaining it, he thanked us for putting all the documentation in and he plainly said, if you didn't have all that information in a letter to us, this bag would never have found its way onto an airplane. So it's always think ahead, the people that may see your equipment and tools if you're traveling. A lot of people don't know about the equipment we use or what it is. Uh, same thing has happened to guys with laser tachometers, guys that do engine surveys and pre-purchase work, where they open up the bag and there's this thing with the laser warning on it. You know, next thing is everyone steps back three feet at the TSA desk. So here in New York or in the United States, when we take samples, it's done in accordance with the American Oil Chemist Society method of, of sampling. As I mentioned, the samples at the bottom are done with the bacon bomb and they take material from just about a half inch off the bottom of the tank is where the material enters the, the instrument. Uh, as I say, mid-range samples are done with a cage sampler. And you have to know your product. And because all you can really do on board the ship is look at it. So you want to know the color of your product based by the grade, be familiar with it. You're looking at your samples. Is there any evidence of water droplets in it or, or free water? Is the clarity of the product correct? Does it smell the way it's supposed to? Um, in castor oil, haze becomes a, a real issue. It's a manufacturing defect. And haze is a protonaceous material in the oil that settles out over time and shows up mainly as the oil cools, but it's considered a manufacturing defect. We always look for that. Of course, you're looking for anything that doesn't belong in the oil, any foreign matter or visible particulate, things of that nature. Um, chain of custody is very important. As I mentioned, sampling is always done in the presence of someone representing the ship if it's on board or if we're on shore, it's done in the presence of uh, someone working for the terminal. Um, our clients always want that their samples delivered directly to them. Other samples go to a local laboratory and that's all done personally. We don't do it by shipping. We have someone actually drive them out to where they have to go. Um, we retain most samples for 90 days in case there's a claim or a dispute. We have a secure storage facility. Only three people actually have access to it. Uh, if, there's, if we're notified of a dispute, the samples are now put off and saved longer. Uh, any, if our client even wants our samples, they have to ask for them in writing. And if anyone wants analysis, we never give up our entire sample. Um, we'll have a third party present, we'll decant our sample by half, seal that and provide that, and then we retain the, the original half until uh, the matter has been disposed of as far as any legal action or claim. 
this is one of the ships that we've worked with. If you look at this one, there's three cargo lines coming off the ship. Uh, we've got two or maybe three different grades of product coming off there. And in this case, they travel about a quarter of a mile to the tank through that whole piping system and manifold system. Um, occasionally, you'll get a call and you're asked if you can look at something else on a ship. This was kind of interesting. And this ship had, was in a collision while it was anchored in a port in India waiting to load. And there was a puncture in the side of the hull. The ship made a temporary repair and made the trip from India all the way to the port of New York with that plate on the side. The superintendent for the ship called us and said, we're wondering if you could take a look at this temporary repair and let us know if you think it's suitable to go back to sea or should we get a company to come in and, and weld it and do a proper repair. So we took a look at it. It's a large plate. You've got rubber being used as a gasketing material. It really doesn't look to me like a great you know, temporary repair, but at sea, it's good. And you look a little further on the aft side of it, there's some cloth stuffed in, trying to help it keep it sealed. You look a little further, it turns out that cloth was someone's long johns that they stuffed in there with the rubber gasketing. Um, needless to say, we recommended that they had someone come out conduct a full inspection and make proper repairs. Um, cargo work comes at all hours of the day, all times of year. There are times you're riding out on a launch in weather like this to get to your ship up here in the Northeast. Uh, this is just an overview of a CCR or cargo control room on one of the tankers that we've worked with. Um, everything happens here. Uh, our meetings are either conducted in the CCR or in the chief's office. Uh, this is where the safety meeting is held before all work starts. All paperwork is reviewed here, copies made here. And we generally use either the CCR or the chief's office as our office while we're on board. Due to the duration of time we spend on board, we usually get a cabin or two for our people. Uh, and they treat us pretty well for the most part. And you've always got to look at things. Um, here's a line that was going to a smaller tank carrying a different product. And we look at it, it didn't look very good. Folks at the terminal said, oh, that line's been fine. Been like that a long time, never been a problem. So it looks like you may have some seepage there. Oh, no, no, that's just dirt on it. We look a little closer. We kind of end up arguing the fact and saying, no, we're not accepting this line. Finally, they did change it. Uh, this is after the barge was uh, loaded at lightering. This is for the discharge of the barge at another location. Um, when you arrive at a ship, I always like to look at the ship and consider the conditions, uh, the condition of the vessel itself and the conditions you see on board. Now, this picture was taken at a terminal, but we actually boarded this ship in the anchorage. And, you know, again, I stress it's, it's the home of the crew while they're on board. And we get to this one, they lower the accommodation ladder. I look at it. There are steps that are broken, sections that are missing. It's a giant piece of corroded metal. Called back up to the ship and said, raise that up, send us down a pilot ladder. We weren't going to walk on this. It didn't look safe to us by any means. If you look in the left side of the picture, there's a whole section of the step missing, as is on the step in the middle of the picture, there's a whole section of the step plates missing. If you look, compare it to the other ones beyond that, you see how much metal corroded and broke off this. There's no reason for this to even be on board at this point. Uh, same vessel, you get up, you look at the conditions on deck, there's just detritus everywhere, there's oil, there's leaking valves, and we know we're gonna have issues with our product on this one. And again, I question that a loading port surveyor accepted the conditions on this vessel. There's loose items all over the deck of the ship. Um, and again, like I say, this is the home of the crew. These are the conditions we found when we got on board after this ship made a 30 day voyage to get to the US. Uh, the doors and the accommodation spaces, everything's filthy, covered with dirt and grease. This is the, the, the crew's mess, the condition of it. Um, 
this ship, we had multiple issues with things that went on while we were on board. Uh, all different issues. We had products of uh, problem with product quality, product contamination. Obviously, looking at the ship, morale was quite low. Uh, confined space entry. If you're not trained or certified in it, don't do it. You just don't want to be the guy in the middle of this photograph. Um, basically, you also have to watch out. Pirates come in all shapes and sizes. And I'm going to open it up for some questions from you folks at this point. I'm going to get myself back in here, I believe. Did I get myself back on here? Yeah, I can see you, Jerry. Excellent. Let me try to come back around. And anyone that has any questions, I'd be happy to field some. We started a little late, but we're good. But uh, about 3.30, I have to prepare for a deposition, so to speak, on another channel on Zoom today. Oh, you're Zoomed out. <laughs> so... It, do we have any any questions from anyone? Any questions for Jerry? I, I've got to say, fantastic and, and a very insightful presentation. Thank uh, you. Some of the stuff you see, I mean, uh, ladders that are a complete mess. Uh, I just don't understand. It, it strikes me as being uh, as a bit of an outsider looking in. Why on earth don't you just replace the ladder? Uh, and, and it's 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 incredible to me some of these things. I mean, we've had conditions that were just unbelievable on many vessels. And you know, you look at it and say, this is their home. Look at the condition of where they eat. Yeah. Um, sadly, some of these things are, are affected where when you have vessels that are multinational crews, um, many of them function like a cask system. And you know, officers are treated well, living well, and crew, crew or not. And I'm not really going to delve into it, but a lot of that has to do with certain nationalities, which has been our experience. Uh, when your officers are of one nationality and your crew may be another, mm. you see an incredible disparity, uh, yeah. Yeah. even in the food that they're being served. Yeah, that's distressing. So what we do is, you know, we know they've traveled long. They've often had a hard voyage. Uh, sweets are hard to come by on ships. So we usually show up with a few boxes of donuts for the crew. Uh, kind of makes people feel a little better, a little happier about what's going on. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice touch, Jerry. And I have to say, what an awesome poem. Uh, you, you've got some rave reviews for the uh, rendition of the poem. Fantastic. <laughs> and, and, and I found it, as I mentioned, totally by accident. Yeah. And... You know, and like I say, it's the only thing I've ever found, you know, really written about our profession. Yes, no, it's fantastic. I have a question from Nicole. Uh, she just says, well done. But other than yourself, who else is doing training for LBC inspections? Wait, say that again. Uh, other than yourself, who is doing training for LBC inspections? OK, so I have a fellow who's worked with me for a number of years, who's also actually uh, an NFPA marine chemist. He's out doing the you know uh, hot work permits. He's doing uh, all the confined entry work. He works with me. Um, and Nicole, some years back, worked the ship with us when she was down here in the States. Um, it's almost hard, believe it or not, in our organization. There's very few people that are interested or want to be involved. Yeah. Yeah. A big part is the hours involved. Of course. And, you know, unfortunately, um, ships rarely arrive as scheduled. That also, Jerry, I know from speaking to some other what I call big commercial ship surveyors in the UK is a reason why youngsters don't want to come into the profession to do that type of work. They just don't want to get up at three in the morning and it's cold and wet and miserable and go out and meet a ship coming into port. And I think that is. A oh, yeah. Thing. I have spent. And it was amazing. We used to joke and say they planned it. I have spent more Christmas days on ships, more Easter Sundays on ships, yeah. more Fourth of July and New Year's Eve on ships than I spent with my family for years. Yeah. Fourth of July, we're really sure they plan it because they want to be in the harbor to see the fireworks. <laughs> is what we figure. But you know, you can you get it like I get notification on a ship 
before it loads. We're going to be loading a ship in, you know, 14 days. We'll follow up and the ship leaves. Now I got an ETA of 33 days. Yeah. And then once a week, we'll get changes. As it gets closer, we'll get a noon report. Um, I've had them where it's coming on the 4th, it's coming on the 4th, and on the 3rd, ship will be here on the 7th. Mm. So you're constantly rearranging your other work schedule. Um, it can it can be painful economically when you're rearranging other work for these. Mm. And the schedules change, they come late, they come early. Uh, it's rare that they're early, it's often that they come late. And pretty rare that they're ever within the 24 hours it was originally predicted. Yeah. They're, they're slow moving vessels, uh, the average parcel tanker that, that we deal with has a cruising speed of just about 14 knots. Yeah. Where if you look at container ships, they're moving 20, 23 knots very often. Yeah. At a much higher profit margin also. Yeah. Jerry, fantastic. I don't have any other questions for you. So I think you've satisfied everybody's need. Uh, some nice comments back to you from people who've been uh, uh, listening to you. So thank you very much indeed for coming to speak. Much appreciated. And um, I will let you go on and get on with the rest of your day. Okay, my pleasure. I thank you. I hope I, I hope I did well for you. Randy, okay. I hope you liked it. Yeah, well, Randy, Randy, did you like it? You can open your microphone, James, because you're next yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. Exactly what we were looking for.